Folks, welcome inside the Paris Sea Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, coming on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphone so you can stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. We can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today, streaming worldwide. And I get a chance today to talk to a cat I've been looking to track down for some time. He's part of the lineage and the spiritualism of the diaspora <clears throat> that came over from Africa and the slave trade and the rhythms that came into New Orleans and Congo Square. And uh, he continues today to try to drive some of those rhythms into the ears of our youth so that they can understand where the rhythms came from, how they intersect with other forms of music, and how they can extend the musical vocabulary and that language. Joe Lasty, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Oh, thank you for having me, man. You know, we have a game on this program called Name That Voice. Um, I'm going to put this in. It's, it's, uh, I want you to take a listen to what he's uh, saying, and then uh, we'll come back and break it down. Okay, let's do it. Well, you know, one of the elements was, like I said, that was uh, uh, kept alive was the the spiritual element, and uh, that in in New Orleans, it's especially it seems it was able to uh, survive and flourish, and in New Orleans, and it, just in uh, the European mind, it was called voodoo, and in New Orleans, hoodoo, uh, right. based on the Yor the Yoruba voodoo religion. And uh, you know there was a, a another religious um, sect from the Congo area, and that was the music was the main connection with the people and the spirits. And yeah, in in some of the a lot of there is the drum, and there were other like uh, tone instruments as well, uh, but the drum was the main one that that connected. Uh, at, at a ceremony, at a you know uh, a spiritual ceremony or a church service, like in New Orleans, the spiritualist churches and the holiness churches they call them, uh, the, the way they dressed and the things they did in the church after going to Haiti and see, uh, really witnessing a real uh, voodoo ceremony in Haiti, I realized that that's what they were doing in those churches, <laughs> and. Uh, that even the um, possession they called it, or the you know the uh, being ridden by the Lord, where the spirit came in and took over the person and spoke to the people, uh, was uh, in the church they called it something else. But they dressed in white with the uh, the uh, tignons on the heads of the women, they're all in white dresses, and their movements. When I saw that thing, it here, I said, well, this is exactly what they were doing in the church, like the church where uh, um, uh, Mr. Lasty was the pastor and the drummer. Do you have any idea who that is? Whoa. It's kind of, I, I don't know who it is, but it's like Frank Zaman. You know, that was uh, my first interview with the late, great Charlie Neville. Whoa. Yeah, from uh, August wow. 2017, my friend. So your your family's lineage has been a big part of my program, and I really just want you to talk as best you can right. about this church where I want to say it was your great-grandfather was the pet? Pa the pa no, I just my, 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 grand my grandfather's. Deacon Frank Lasty. Now let's just go through that. How did he, how did he c explain that entire evolution of how he became the pastor and ultimately? Because uh, I think Charlie said that that your granddad used to play the drums with his hands sometimes. Yeah, he used to play the drums with the hands. But where he picked up all that up up at at the Millie Boys home when he was with Louis Armstrong. Now that's where he picked all of that up. Can you please, if, like, if you just, I mean, Joe, it, this is, can you, for, I'm 40 years old. I would love if you could explain to my audience what you mean by him picking it up from Louis Armstrong. Well, they was all sent to this boy's home and where a lot of um, them to keep their mind off the troubles and off the troubles that they was getting into, they introduced these bad kids 
to the instruments. And that's where we found Louis Armstrong, um, my grandfather, um, and, and all the other greats. From that, from them going to the boys' home and getting into the music and into the, you know, the New Orleans culture way of doing things. So um, can you just talk about the patterns? I mean, it's amazing because some cats will say Louis Armstrong was a, was the greatest rhythmist of all time, and I didn't know what that meant. But what what kind of rhythms was, were you, was your granddad playing? Um, and he and explain how he because he got I, he didn't have a, a trap set. I assume he was probably playing you know chairs and whatever he get his hands on. Right, right, right. Well, well, well. If you were listening to my grandfather play a couple of times, you could tell he get it from the marching band back in the days back there. You could tell the way he, because he used to do his press rolls, and through press rolls, you know, through me with my playing, it all surrounds that marching um, sound, and that marching snare, snare drum sound, you know, and then if you listen back in the days when the marching bands, you know, the, the snare drum played a big part of that. And I know, and then, you know, as I got older, that's when I started to realize Wow, that's where this um, this rhythm and this beat come from. Really, the the, the um the marching bands, and that's what they had back in the days. The marching band. Then they turned them them into the um brass band, which we call nowadays. Let me ask you. Um, uh, was how did was your did your granddad who came who was from your family came over? In uh, via the slave trade. I mean, how did your family actually get to? I mean, were they? Because like there was another cat, uh, to Saint Louverture, you know, who uh, mm-hmm. Napoleon couldn't penetrate Haiti because of he had his his people so invigorated by the drum. You know, it's. I mean, as a whole, can you can you take us through your understanding of how your family came to the Americas? Not that part. I cannot help you with that part. I <laughs> it's going that. too far back. Okay. I was going too far back. That part, I, I only, I'm, a, I only stop is, you know, with my grandfather. And can I pick it back off the um, what you was mentioning your um. Yeah, do it, do it, yeah, do it, then. yeah. You, you was mentioning the ladies in the churches with the white on and the white caps. Absolutely. And the little white. Well, Charlie, Charlie was, was Charlie was saying that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Charlie was saying. That. Well, where, what they were left to say, it was spiritual churches. That's when I knew I was in a spiritual church when I used to see the um, ushers and the ladies with the white on and the white, you know, bandana like around the head, or a cap on their heads. And that's where my memory comes from as a spiritual church. And that's where all, all of that spirit came in <laughs> to, to today you know i go to the spiritual churches okay so this is incredibly exciting uh the the ping the pinyons right that that was the mm-hmm. the headdress um right now um like i've interviewed clyde stubblefield and jabo and and they they went to the spiritual churches some people would call them the sanctified churches and um right, right. i and what, what was interesting is that they did not um there was no trap set in those churches. It was essentially tambourines, some mm-hmm. sticks, hand clapping. Can you talk about um, the church where your grand? What was the name of the spiritual church that your granddad was the pastor at? And then, what were those rhythms? It wasn't like what you have today with sort of this almost a formula trip with, as it relates to improvisational music with a rhythm section and uh, mm-hmm. you know solo. Mm-hmm. So I could just paint the picture because to me. What I hear in modern, this is a, a generalization because I don't spend a lot of time in churches, but I hear worship music today. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't hear spirit. I just want you to define the idea of the spiritualism of the music, uh, the spiritual church. For someone from my generation, what did that mean? What did it look like? What did it feel like? And how did it influence you? Well. Number one, the, the the name of my grandfather's church was it was Israelite spiritual church. That's 
that's what was the name of the church. And where the drums come in at with the rhythm, now I often tell people the same songs that we play in traditional jazz, I used to play them in church. My grandfather used to play them in church. For instance, a simple song like When the Saints Go Marching In. When the Saints, well, you know, when the Saints Go Marching In, it had that spiritual feeling. And when I play that, I bring that spiritual feeling that I picked up in the spiritual church watching my grandfathers play. Not only watching them play, feeling what they were playing and how the um, the ushers and the congregation, how they was mesmerized when the beat start, they get to shout and they get to dance. And, and, and you know, once they start doing that, and that's when you know the spirit is coming out of the drums and that beat. That beat. It doesn't necessarily have to be a fast song. It can be a slow song where that drum hit a certain beat, where that spirit will just come through the church. And when they when it comes through the church, that's another thing. It with you when you say sanctify, it used to call shouting. They used to shout. And that's when what we call them getting the Holy Ghost in them. Oh, sister so and so shouted today. We we had to carry her out. And that's my memory of a spiritual church and where the feeling come in at is that same signified that same beat that we played in church. It can be carrying it on to today in the New Orleans music, in all music really. Um, I just, this is interesting because I go to a lot of concerts, like last night I went to a concert and it was uh, just a couple of dear friends playing uh, guitar and bass and they were singing great tunes and I wanted to get up and let the body dance. I mean, the idea of the, yeah, ho- exactly. the, the Holy Spirit getting inside of you, I mean, can you talk about the presentation? Because what you're talking about is someone allowing themselves, p- patrons of the church to become vulnerable and open themselves up to the spirit. How how right. how 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 did like how long was the like would your dad start with a bunch of rhythm stuff and then incorporate cla- explain the presentation in order to get people comfortable enough to feel vulnerable enough to allow the spirit to enter them? Well, number one, you start off with a slow chant. We saw call it a, a slow chant, and you get to praying, and through the prayers that's when you would receive that Holy Ghost feel. And each time we start off our um, church service, you know, it used to, we bow on our knees and start chanting and, and singing the slow song. And as you chant and singing and slow songs are going, that's when that, now I'm only giving you my opinion, that's when that, that, that spirit hits you. When when all of that is going on, that, and that is through prayers, I have to say that that's through prayers and praying for that to come in. Now, if you don't do that, I don't think you'll get it. Well, what okay, it. but how much of it correlates? This is so important <clears throat> to allow letting the body dance. You see parishioners today; they sit in pews and pray in a sedentary situation. But how much of it has to do with the actual physical movement? as well as the prayer the physical movement now that ooh to see that there we go again with through the prayers and stuff and when the music start it it kind of like it hits you cuz today um first and if you had a second line here in New Orleans and the music starts going to beat, and then all of a sudden, wait, dude, it hits you. You're ready to dance. So <laughs> that same way. Yeah, I dig. You know, huh? I, I totally you dig. I, I dig it. I dig, yes. Well, that's similar to the same thing. That's just similar to the same thing. Uh, get in, into your inner soul. Because sometimes the preacher could be, uh, somebody could be praying, and they could be just praying for you. And they, didn't, they don't even know they're praying for you, and, and then it hits you. And then once you get happy, you get happy, and, and, and it hits you. It gets you to start dancing and shouting. 
talking to Joe Lasty here on the Jake Feinberg show. Um, we did, I mean, the clip, Charlie and I did two hours of interviews, and I'll send you those because you're going to love them because we talk quite a bit about your grandfather, actually. But, um, uh-huh. you know, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, what was your understanding of, I just want to be clear also, but your, your granddad encouraged dancing in, in the church. I mean, it was yeah. not discouraged because like, what I'm saying is like you literally go in today, even at the concert, it wasn't a, a, a religious ceremony last night, but people, I mean, uh, Anglo people are taught to sit and watch and clap. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I have to believe it, it got pretty rowdy when the, when the cats were starting to fall out of the pews and stuff. I mean, that to me is what, that's the spirit and of, that's the beauty of, of, of God, you know, and, and I, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that that still goes on today, but I just feel like in some churches it wouldn't be accepted. Your grandfather was somebody who encouraged that and tried to bring people out of their own. Right. Is that true? No, nah, no. Nah, right. You, you see what you just said now is a whole, is so true because that's where we get into the drums at. He was one of the first ones that introduced the drums to the church. So that, spiritual um feeling of the drums come in so you're right they had they, they do have different congregation that doesn't allow you to dance or don't doesn't allow you to have drums and music in the churches that's what he was so important at and, and is allowed and they're letting him allow him to introduce the drums to the church this is so beautiful man okay so i want to be clear i and i don't know i know you don't have probably an exact answer but would you say that he was the first cat to bring a trap set into the church or some kind of modified yes. drum he was the first cat yes yes, yes i will go that for you oh i love it uh, and was it a sid catlett trap set or was it what what was that trap set look like i'm gonna tell you see that that's what i've i've learned how to play on watching him play and watching him play and the only thing we had was the bass drum the snare drum and one ride cymbal. That's it. I love this. Oh my god! So expl- <laughs> I mean, just talk about how to create beautiful rhythms. Sound out of that. Yeah, because you know, yeah, because you have to create. You'd also that's the other thing about that era. There, the PA systems were so antiquated. I mean, you didn't. Exactly. You had to. We didn't have no amplification. So that's you had to create your own volume. How did he do? How did he? Oh, cre- yeah. yeah, I want you to just riff on it. How did he create that rhythm with just? The modified trap. Well, that's what I was explaining to you earlier. He had a certain way where he used to hold his drumsticks and play on that snare drum and that cymbal where it wasn't too loud, it wasn't too low. He knew how to come down, he knew when to come up. And and to today, you know, when I when I was coming up, I had to control my volume too with that. But but keep in mind you still have to have that that spirit through the drums you still had to have that drive you know you still had to have that so he he was able to develop that like that and until today i that, like i say me and my cousin Harold, and we do it we still doing it and, and it just sticks out with me when he used to hold his drumsticks and get that little soft ting 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 sound in, out of that and with the cymbals when he would ride on a cymbal you know but we still had to have that like Mm, that combination with that bass drum and that snare drum, we still had to have that little combination in, and I, that's where I think it comes in at with that. I mean, this is unbelievable. So, I mean, was there other? Was it just the drums, or did they have other like piano. melodic instruments? They had a piano. Are you kidding me? They had a piano. This is. Yeah. They had like some yeah. Uh, upright. Yeah, my, aunt, my aunt used. My aunt used to play the piano. Mike. Yeah, but but back then my aunt didn't play the piano. Yeah, back then she didn't. But further along, but you know what? I I, I hate to go off base with you with this. No, do it, do it. But I, I I was just in Russia this August, and something hit where I tried to do a solo. I did a solo. Can you believe the people started swing dancing? I'm doing a solo now. 
dude, I, I, I'm so, I, dude, I, I'd be right with them, man. I'd be right there with them. Right, and and there was swing dance. So that goes to show you the beat. You know, my beat and that New Orleans beat. That new, it doesn't have necessarily have to be in a swing form. I mean, I was doing uh, actually a, a solo, <laughs> and these people were actually swing dancing. Dude, wait. I mean, well, I guess there's a difference between swing dancing and just sort of gyrating. I mean, I, God, I would have loved to have seen that. I mean, but also the thing is that, uh, you know, that was what Jabo and Clyde told me was like the the cat the cast that came over on the ships they would clap but it wasn't on two and four sometimes it was on three mm-hmm. and four it was it was it, it was not it, the traditional one three or two four clapping i mean how did that mm-hmm. did that help create the new orleans sound in in some ways i mean the, the idea that these the, the those indigenous hand clapping rhythms and the tambourine right. with the modified track. I was just about to tell you that. And the tambourine. Absolutely. Right, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Because, um, you know, you know lot, lots of times, if you didn't have an organ, uh, not an organ, I'm sorry, a piano, or something like that, that's where the hand clapping and the tambourine comes in there, too. Even without the drums. The, the clapping and the um, tambourines, uh, it, 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 you couldn't even get the spirit with that, with just the tambourine and the clapping and the chanting. You know, and, it, and back in those days, they used to do that. They used to do that. You um, yeah. maybe could talk a little bit about um, hoodoo. What is hoodoo? Um, voodoo. Not hoodoo. N- so you call it voodoo. You call it, yeah, it's, it's voodoo. Is like a voodoo. Well, you know, my grandmother was a part of that. I don't know if you know Dr. John. Well, I, you know what? It's funny. I he I have an interview with him that I did, and he's talking about Melvin Lasty opening. And my grandmother and my grandmother. He used to come to my grandmother to get spiritual advice. Oh, yes. Really? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Dr. Oh. John. Yeah, and he'll tell you that. <laughs> well, this this. This is what Charlie said in the, I just want to read it. He goes, one of the spiritual elements that was kept alive in New Orleans in the European mind, in the European mind, it was called voodoo. In New Orleans, Uh in New Orleans, it was called hoodoo. It was part of the Yoruba religion. And there was another religious sect from the Congo area as well. So, but you're saying it's not hoodoo, it's voodoo. That's what I was told. You know, know, back in the day, we even... Oh, they're putting a the voodoo on somebody, you know. Nah, hoodoo. Yeah, you could be right with the hoodoo, but I always. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, voodoo. You know, what about this uh, M- Marie Laveau? Did you have a chance? Mar- did you know? Marie Laveau, the voodoo queen. Now, you heard what I just said? I, I did. Marie Laveau, the voodoo queen, way down yonder in New Orleans. So now where hoodoo come in at? Got me? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm just, listen, that's just from the interview with Charlie. You know, I mean, it's just that, uh, you yeah, know. No, 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 I'm just, I'm just only saying you. Now you hear what I'm talking about? I did. I, you but know. I mean, the idea that that's the, what I kind of wanted to ask you about was the idea where, you know, Africans came here and the Europeans said, you are savages. Uh, you, you know, you. It, you are not uh, you're you're beneath us because you are not Christian and obviously uh, your skin color proves that but then right. Marie Laveau was doing these ceremonies for upper class white people um, mm-hmm. and like w- was that common uh, and and how did your grandfather or even your dad used to talk about that kind of stuff because I mean it was a complete double standard. Exactly, exactly. Well, it well, put the do do voodoo, uh, voodoo on you, you know, or uh, somebody will come for some spiritual advice. Because I had another uncle, he used to do it too. People used to come all over the world to come to him as a you know a spiritual advisor or to put a hex on somebody. Or they'd say they want 
this job and they'll come down to New Orleans and he would give them candles and give them rituals and stuff. Well, the same way with my grandmother. She used to, people used to come to her too. And, um, and they used to give, she used to give them spiritual advice. So it was in my family. None of us had picked up on it in my generation. But my um, my grandfather and uncles, there was the last one that did that. That is absolutely so. But you're, I mean, you have memories of Mac Rebinac coming over and and res- oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And this was stuff that was like, I mean, I was I was actually at a ceremony for the Queen of Congo uh, last year at Bill Summers' house in New Orleans. And mm-hmm. it's so funny because I, I, I tried to take some photos and one of the one of the women was like, no. And then mm-hmm. Bill Summers was like, you know, these are this, this is this is really this is not to be seen. This is very spiritual stuff. And. You know, right. I, he goes. So if whatever photos you have on your phone, you got to erase them. And so I, I, uh, I didn't take any more photos, and I was totally respectful, and I totally went through the, the, the um, ceremony. And a day later, Joe, uh, Joe, um, <clears throat> I was out at the, um, the sidebar catching some music, and I came back to the hostel I was staying at, and my phone was gone. Disappeared. Whoa. It disappeared. Wow. Gone. Gone. And I'm telling you, at that point, I said, oh, man, this is for real, man. I mean, was there... I mean, yeah, it was, yeah. It was hard. Was, was there a point, in, as a boy, I'm talking about, when you really felt there was a period, of, uh, there was a time when, the first time when you were like, when the spirit got hold of you? Ooh. Yeah, when I was in church, yes, it definitely. When I was in church one um, Sunday, and um, they was playing this, they was doing this song and, and chanting, and the spirit got into me, and I just started crying, you know. Just started crying for no reason. I was a boy. What am I crying for? <laughs> that's right. That's right. You had no idea why you were so moved. Right. Crying. You and uh, would you say that even though you're you're not taking part in you know the ceremonies or the um, like your great your your uncle great right? grand yeah yeah my uncle and my grandmother you know even though you're but I mean what is the most authentic spiritual church in New Orleans today how is it similar to your granddad's church and how is it different. Well, we have a um, we have one of them, one of them that I know of that's still living. His name is Palu Francis Oscar, Oscar Francis, and he stood he stood during the um the spiritual ceremonies and stuff. And which another thing you never touched based on too was Black Hawk. Black Hawk was a um, oh, we're, no. We're we're, we're just getting was, started here, man. We we're not yeah, even there I, yet. Don't I, even I, worry about that. I had to start driving. I had to start driving because uh. I was running out of time. I had to go somewhere. But anyway, yeah, you know, through that Black Hawk spirit. So, you know, we still haven't touched base with that yet. Are you saying that you, you're short for time right now, or or can we well, keep... Well, yeah, kind of, kind of, but I, I'm okay. Yeah, no, this, okay is, this is what I, I, I wanted you to talk about. Um, you know, first of all, I'm a Long Island cat, too. I know you moved, moved right. to... I'm from, yeah, Stone, from yeah. Stony Brook. Uh, originally and yeah 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 but what can you talk about when you went there this cat uh clyde harrison and what kind of what was ultimately how he taught you if anything to um keep time uh on the on the on the top of the kit and and maybe use the bass drum more for rebound what what was that working relationship like and and what did he teach you well that that was mostly theory which is, you know, reading music and um, music, jazz at the time. He he definitely couldn't do that, but I had to get my um, my theory in, which is reading music. That's where he came in at. But for us, for for him teaching me that 
that New Orleans rhythm? No, no one could do that. <laughs> you got Absolutely that not. Guy. No, I, I, you know, and, and you, so you became a proficient sight reader because of this cat. Right, exactly. He grew up with my rudiments and stuff like that. He introduced all of that to me. Was he, were you, did you ever get the chance to play any, any gigs? Did you get to go to New York City and see any of the cats? Or I find that to be totally I, fascinating. Man, it's so, it, dude, I'm glad you asked that. Um, I was, I used to live in Huntington, in Dix Hill. Suffolk you know, County, like, baby, yeah. Suffolk County, yeah, 20 Suffolk minutes County. away, baby. Man, guess what? Come to find out, I was going to school with some of the, um, the band members on Saturday Night Live when he first started out. Man, I was going to school with the bass player daughter and the guitar son and stuff like that. And I didn't realize this. Come on, I'm going to school with, <laughs> you know, with these people. Kids. And I did not realize that. Did not realize that. It was weird. But my first now, my first time me playing in the audience was on Long Island, and I wound up playing um, this Hawaii Five O song on a set of drums, and when nobody playing the set of drums then. Wait a wait, uh, how, you, that just went right over my head. Wait, wait, now, what do you, you mean in high school you did this, or what? in what capacity? Junior high. No, this is junior high. Yeah, this was when I was in junior high. I was in Uniondale. We was living in Nassau County. I was living in Uniondale at the time. <sighs> and that's where I played my first um, set of drums at in the stage band. That's what we used to call it, the stage band. Exactly. Okay, so th I, that was the first time you played drums with a band, but you're saying that yeah. I mean, people were playing. What year was this, by the way? Uh, 74, 73, something. Oh, that, I mean, okay, so, I mean, there was, I mean, music was bubbling and burning. I mean, did you, did you, have an op you were still pretty young, but, I mean, did you have a chance mm -hmm. to see, you know, for instance, Mahavishnu Orchestra at that time with Billy Cobb? Or did, were, what kind of music were you getting off on or, or sneaking out to go see? Well, I tried to go. <laughs> I never was old enough to go in this club. I don't know <laughs> if you remember this club in Freeport. It's just called a Swingos. Do, before wait, wait, and it was in free. It was called it was Swingos. Babylon, Swingos. Was, yeah, it was off the of Babylon Turnpike. Oh, this is sick. And that's where the jazz. That's where the jazz players used to play at. And I always wanted to go in there. Till today. <laughs> you got to get. Well, it's gone now, probably, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know. I, I gotta go past that next time I go there. But that, I never did got a chance to go see. You. You know, the, the um, no musicians or nothing. Because number one, I was a little bit too young, you know, to go in the clubs and stuff like that. But then again, you know, the kids in the in the school, they was trying to lead me into a rock era. And and little behold, I might have went to school with Billy Joe or somebody like that, and then not even remembering it. A <laughs> <laughs> cross path with them. They were, I mean, so, so, I mean, it was, so, I mean, the music, you were, uh, would you say that you were, I mean, you were clearly steeped in the New Orleans uh, marching band, that kind of uh, second line rhythms, uh, but in, right. se in 74, I mean, that was like the burgeoning, you know, I mean, I hate that word fusion, because actually the first fusion was Dizzy Gillespie and Chano Pozo, <laughs> but, right, you know, right, right. but, but, you know, we're talking about like electronic rock. Um, were you your yeah, friend? That's you, when all of that I was introduced to that at one time, but I did not like it. What, what, yes, tell me I about the tell me what you didn't about the feel. What, what what was not cool? What was not appealing about the feel of of rock to you? Too, number one, it was too loud, and it didn't have no feeling to it. I to love me. it. Oh, you nailed it. You just nailed it. I mean, I mean, come <laughs> on. Are you kidding me, dude? Who? Tell me what about um. So back in the, I mean, did you get a chance to um, hang with, I mean, you went to that school where you got introduced to Louis Armstrong. When did, when did Willie Metcalf and the Academy of Black Arts come into play? Uh, from high school in New Orleans. 
and I called George Washington Carver, and that's where I was introduced to Willie McCaff and the Academy of Black Art. Now, what? Yeah, sure did. Um, what was the ethos, if that's the right word, of that school? What was the what was what programmatically? What was that? I mean, just the connotation of it. There was a the Academy of Black Arts. What what did that what did that right. mean? What did that mean? Right, good question. But the motive was is taking the kids from the different schools and different neighborhoods and introducing them to the modern, the, the jazz. Because we used to do stuff like um, on Green Dolphin Street and stuff like that. So that's what he had us playing. And then he also had the, um, the, the um, young ladies singing. And some guys we used to come sing too with us. And he was introducing them to, I would, you know what, I would say that New York style jazz, it, it definitely wasn't the New Orleans jazz that he was introducing us to. And right after that, that's when went Marcellus Ellison, Bramson, and all of them explored because all of them went through Willie Metcalf too. Now, this is mm-hmm. fantastic. So, I mean, there was dance, there was singing, there was... Uh-huh. Um, uh, and and were you and when you say like on Green Dolphin Street, I mean, when you you talk about the New York jazz sound, what does that mean to you? Because right. because I mean, I what I love about this show, I've done four thousand interviews. Now I get to talk to Joe Lasty because every every community, Oklahoma City, Chicago, Detroit, Los, it all had their own regional sound. So when you say New York jazz, what is what is that? Can you go a little bit deeper on that? Um, yeah, because um. When I think of the New York jazz style, I think of Dizzy Gillespie and um, Charlie Parker. Okay, so bebop, kind of bebop-ish. Yeah, bebop, yeah, bebop-ish, yeah. So I wouldn't call it New York. I shouldn't say New York. I should have just said the bebop. A little bebop, a little, and yeah, that was, that, I did. Yeah, that, was, that was a Willie Metcalf thing, is the bebop sound. Now, yeah, talk about your yeah. talk about your experiences playing in a band, playing be- Were you caught Did you dig playing bebop on drums? No. No, I did not. I didn't dig it with the um, rock, but I didn't dig it with the... Um, yeah, I couldn't feel it. That's another thing. Yeah. I just couldn't feel that. I couldn't feel it for some reason. No, definitely couldn't feel that music. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. And my playing didn't match up to it, if I'm saying this right. My playing is mostly is like a trad jazz drummer instead of a swinging drummer, a real swinging drummer with the bebop. That's that's why I didn't really get into it too much. Um, I just want to read you. I don't have the audio queued up, but this is from my interview with Dr. John. He said, um, prior to integration in New Orleans, there was a black musicians union, the local 496, and a white union, right. local 174. Melvin Lasty founded all uh-huh. f- all for one records afo records afo 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 man now where where i mean cuz i've interviewed ellis marsalis and he had james black on that label i mean what and this is what dr john said he, he said melvin last he was connected to the spiritual church of new orleans he tried in so many ways to give people awareness about their rights that to me is right. I mean, he was an advocate, man. And and then and, and and who was he was who was that in relation? Who was Melvin? Your father? My uncle. Your and he was the one that was doing the spiritual ceremonies with Doctor John. Yeah, that was my uncle. My my uncle. Um, my uncle Melvin and my other uncle. He his name was David Lasty. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did did when he talks about making people aware um, of their rights, um, what did what did he, what do you what are you what did he what do you think Dr. John meant by that? Wait, wait, say that again. He said that you know aside from starting AFO, he said Melvin Last he tried in so many ways to give people awareness about their rights. 
The unions that were right here in New Orleans were different from the basic structure of unions in general. We didn't get paid for sessions. We had no knowledge of a guy called a contractor. The arrangers had to hustle to get paid for any work they did arranging a session. Those were the bad sides. So was he right, right. Did, was he an educator of all your pe of the people or just the musicians? Uh, it was a musician. But not not a, but my memories my memories of my uncle Melvin was that he was a very business type man. Very business type guy. And he even wanted my uncle Walter and my uncle David to be more business side. And that's what he was reaching out to the musicians and everybody and you know throughout the community is you know we need to get our own black union and black record label and company and stuff and that's when he started that I do remember that and that's where that come from because my uncle Melvin was very business I think Harold Baptiste had something to do with it too oh, you're absolutely 100% correct um but uh yeah he had something to do with it too but i also want to be clear M melvin your uncle melvin as business as he was he could tr put on another hat and become a spiritualist exactly oh that's man right jesus that's where he come from well you know he, he grew up with that you know, did you just before? I, I know you're short on time. We got to do part two if possible, Joe. I mean, we just we're just getting. Okay. Started. But I just wanted to ask you about two guys, and I want you uh -huh. to I want you to talk about their their lineage as it relates to uh, rhythm. Uh, the first cat, Ed Blackwell. The second cat, James Black. Go. Wow! Wow! Ed Blackwell. No, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, Willie Metcalf introduced me. To Ed Blackwell, that's where I found out about Ed Blackwell. Now, what I liked about him, he used to take the brushes, and he used to take a um, uh, his uh, he could even take a solo on a ballad, and man, that was amazing. And Willie Metcalf was the one that introduced me to James Black. But he, he could play a solo on a ballad, dude, on a ballad. Yes, that's with filthy. Brushes. Yeah, with brushes. <laughs> it's kind of like a Papa Joe Jones kind of thing, you know? It's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what my memory of about him. Now, James Black, James Black, ooh. James Black will be funky with you one time, and then you turn around and swing out bebop. So you imagine um, a funky New Orleans drummer and a bebop drummer all into one. And that's what I describe as James Black. I <laughs> uh, did. I mean, Joe Lasty. One thing, can you? I do this all because I've done. I've paid so much homage to the to the lineage of all musics, and I just was hoping you uh -huh. could you Come could talk. Just wanted you to tell me a good, just tell me a good Charlie Neville story, or something about Charlie that uh, will always remain with with all of us. Oh. He cared about, he definitely cared about our, our culture, our music, our spirit, and soul. So, so he, that's what sticks out with me about him. He really cared about us. And, um, and you know, he, he wanted his spirit to linger on, too, you know, through people like you. And I think that's what's happening now. So, in other words, it's, to be short about it, he um he will never be forgotten in memories, like especially like now when I'm doing these interviews. <laughs> <laughs> it could just could you give an example of how he showed how he cared for you? Did he show up at gigs? I mean, what do you mean by caring for you? Well, well he, which means he seen something in me too. In my plane, when he would come around, he would see something in my plane. Yeah. That's that, that's that's what I think it was. You know how people could hear you play and see you playing, and you could see it in their eyes or see it. Well, they just come to see you, and then that's it. But it wasn't it was it wasn't like that with him. It wasn't like that with him. He he was there to he was there to be. He could give you some uh, helpful hints. He did that with all the cats. He would he taught right. Rick, Rick Murata how to play a different kind of. 
a shuffle. So he was he was there as a as a teacher as well. He was curious. He, he was always interested in what the cat. He wasn't there just to just for the just for the party. Right. Joe Lasty, we went for forty five minutes, man. I'll get you a copy of it. We have barely cracked the surface, but thank you so much, man, for uh, All right. for taking the time, man. Okay, no problem. And whenever, just let me know. Yeah, I'm gonna send. Listen, I'm gonna send you. Uh, I'm gonna send you a couple of links to other interviews that where I t- where they, we talk okay. about, and then uh, I'll send you one of this later on too, man. All right, and I'll send you that link to um, my website, JoeLasky.com, and stuff, where you could see where I tried to do a solo and they started swing dancing to it. Oh, so oh, somebody ca- in Russia, somebody got that on tape. Yeah, yeah, oh, I dude. Send my, please send my, that immediately. Yeah, I need to sing that. I, that is so badass. <laughs> All right, young man. Have a great day, Joe. I'll talk to you soon. Uh, send me your email so I can send it. I will. Okay. Later on, dude. Good enough. All right. Later. Wow. That's where the rubber meets the road on the Jake Feinberg show. Uh, we will be back um, at some point in the near future. Not sure when. Um, but until then.